One. In case you are wondering, I am a female in my twenties, five foot two, and around one hundred pounds. This event happened recently while I was at work. It had been a busy day at my small office following a four-day holiday weekend. Things had slightly settled down by 4 p.m. when a client stopped by to pick up some paperwork. I have known this guy for over three years. The extent of our relationship is professional small talk. Nate is a big burly dude with a shaved head and a long beard. In all the time that I have known him, we have not had any major issues. While I'm not sure if this is relevant, I do feel that I should point out that Nate had been acting rather odd towards me for the past year. Little things, but enough to make me take notice. If I answered the phone when he would call, he wouldn't say anything and just hung up. He'd be super friendly with my co-workers, but completely ignore me. It all began about a year prior when my boss informed him that I'm a fellow scuba diver. After discovering this information, Nate repeatedly asked me to be his dive buddy, while assuring me that he knew all of the best spots and where to find secret shipwrecks. He wrote his number on a piece of paper and asked me to call him, but I never did. When he began to act strangely towards me, I had just assumed that he was offended that I didn't want to go out with him. So on to the reason why this story ever happened. I've had chronic hiccups for the past 15 years, they literally just started out of nowhere one day and have never stopped. Usually I only get one or two small ones throughout the day, which my friends and family lovingly refer to as hourly hiccups. However, maybe once or twice a month I get a bout which can last hours. I have seen a doctor about this, yet it still remains a mystery. This was one of those days where I could not stop hiccuping. I was in my office while Nate stayed in the main lobby area where my boss assisted him. About five minutes into their conversation, he yelled, I know the cure for your hiccups! To which I chuckled. Believe me, I have tried every old wives' tale and trick known to man. What I have learned in over a decade is that the only thing that actually works is time. I continued working in my office, trying to stifle my hiccups, and not be too loud. After three years of working here, all of my co-workers knew about my problem and barely even notice anymore. About 45 minutes go by and they still have not stopped. At this point I am getting fed up. Anyone who has had hiccups for a lengthy amount of time knows that eventually your abdominal muscles get sore and you start to feel nauseous. So when Nate said again, I know how to cure your hiccups. I was desperate for any relief. I walked out of my office and approached him. What's your secret? I asked. To which he simply replied, You'll see. Figuring it was the usual method to frighten me, I firmly informed him that I did not want to be scared. I'm just one of those people who hates getting startled suddenly. Nate walks past me and says nothing, so I figured his original plan to spook me had been sabotaged. I was just about to turn around and get back to work, when he grabbed me from behind. Suddenly he threw me into a choker hold, while forcefully covering my mouth and nose with his hand. Immediately panic sets in, and I struggle to free myself, but his grip only gets tighter and more intense. It felt like I was being coiled by a boa constrictor. No matter how hard I try to get him off me, I could not compete with his body weight and strength. I began to punch and kick him, but he only seemed to get angrier. My vision started to turn black, and I became incredibly tired and dizzy. I could feel myself about to pass out. All I wanted was to breathe. How could this be happening? I was about to be murdered at my fucking workplace while my colleagues were just one room over the entire time. Although this moment felt like a lifetime, it probably only lasted about two minutes. I tried to scream and make noise, but my mouth was covered too tightly. The taste of his hand filled my mouth, and I felt like I was going to be sick. Right as I was drifting out of consciousness, I heard someone yell, Hey, get off her! Let her go! 
my boss who had previously been making a phone call in his office, had just entered the lobby. He approached Nate and dragged him off me. After the ambush, Nate released me from his grip and began to walk towards the exit nonchalantly. While I stumbled and gasped for air, Nate turned to face me before he left. With a sick and twisted smile, he told me, I got rid of your hiccups. He proceeded to leave while I fought back the tears that were welling. I didn't want him to think he had won somehow. Once he was gone, my boss asked me if I was okay. I only nodded out of embarrassment that I'd start crying if I attempted to answer. As I made my way back to my office, my brain tried to comprehend what the fuck had just transpired in the past three minutes. Nothing else was mentioned after Nate left. I wore a collared shirt the next day to hide the bruises that covered my neck, of which I did take photos. God forbid I ever need to use them in the future. I'm sure Nate would say he was just kidding, but the way he drew pleasure from my pain and suffering does not lead me to believe this. My boyfriend wanted me to press assault charges, but honestly I didn't see the point. Firstly, the police in my area tend to do nothing in these types of situations. And the most disturbing part of all, my boss backed Nate up. He has known him for almost 20 years and pretty much told me that I asked him to do it. What hurts the most is that he doesn't really seem to care about my safety or well-being. I fear that it is only a matter of time before I see Nate again because he is still a client. Since I am not the business owner, I cannot prevent him from returning. In fact, events like this happening at my workplace are the reason I am currently looking for a new job. Not to mention I often work by myself and the office is connected to a psychiatric facility with sometimes problematic patients. Hopefully when Nate does come back, I will no longer be employed there. I truly hope we will never meet again. Update. Yes, I still have chronic hiccups following this event. 2. I was born in the northeast of Brazil region, known by its marvelous beaches. I was a very beautiful child and everyone used to pay attention to me when I was out with my parents. Fortunately, my parents always took care of me and never let me even for one second alone with strangers. And our house was a fortress. Like many houses here, we have giant walls and fences around the house. When it happened, I was five or six years old, 95 or 96, and was going out with my mother to the farmer's market in the downtown. I used to live five to eight minutes from it. It was morning and there was a lot of people at the bus stop, including this creepy woman standing up front of us. There was nothing really creepy about her looks, but I remember that she was the first person I noticed when we stopped there. I always had a strong gut feeling to what people are up to, and I did not like her when I glanced. She was wearing a sleeveless white shirt, blue jeans and black shoes. Really 90s. She was looking around like she was looking for someone, and then she looked back and saw me. It was the only time she gave a glance to my mom. Really quick. After that, she couldn't take her eyes off of me. Before time, combis were a kind of public transportation too. When this one arrived, my mom pulled my hand gently to warm me. We would go into that car. Before we got in, this woman ran and passed in front of me to sit in the middle bench, where we were going to sit. It was okay. We got in anyway, and I sat with this woman on my left and my mom on my right side. Until here, my face was the same. I never smiled, talked, or did anything different. Than to give this woman a mean stare. I did not like her and wanted to show her I knew she was a problem. But once I sat by her side, she started to grin in a creepy way and started to bend to try to talk to me really low. I ignored her. I wanted to look the other side, but I felt that I needed to pay attention to whatever she could do. I needed to have her in my field of vision. I remember her asking my name, my age, if I liked my school, and I remained silent and touched my mom's leg. 
My mom noticed it and told her out loud, stop trying to talk to my child. The woman was ignoring my mom and kept trying to make me talk to her. So my mom yelled, want to talk? Talk to me, bitch, and moved me to her right side, staying between me and this creepy woman. It was probably other words, but I can't remember it, and bitch is the closest translation. Even with my mom in the middle, the woman didn't stop trying to talk to me, and I remember my mom telling me to show my tongue to her to try to make her stop. I did the best I could, showed my tongue with a really mean face, and she was still with a grin on her face. Meanwhile, it was our destination and my mom got out of the combi really fast, with me, and we started walking, hands on. That's when the scariest moment of my life happened. I had the feeling that I needed to look back, and I did only to find that the woman also left the combi after us. I saw her standing up in front of the car, looking at us walking, and then she looked to her left side, which was an avenue. I felt that I had to follow her eyes, and I did it again. I thank myself every day that I followed my instincts that day. I found out that she was looking at two men standing on the other side of the avenue, and she gave them a kind of signal with her hands and pointed at us. They spotted us in the crowd and started running towards us. I pulled my mom's arm and told her to watch out. My mom told me gently, but scared, to run like I never did before and never leave her hand. I did it. I ran as fast as I could with my mom while we were being chased by three strange people. We were done if they caught us. These guys were really tall and fast. One of them, a skinny blonde guy with white shirt, blue jeans and a funny hat. The other one was a muscled black man with a dark shirt and also blue jeans. My mom didn't want to stop and ask for help without a police car near us. In Brazil, people are really helpful and the farmer's market was crowded that day. But what if nobody decides to help after seeing the giant guys chasing us? My mom didn't want to give a try and maybe lose me. So we ran as fast as we could and between many streets and the main church. We ran four or five rounds around the church and then a police car appeared parking in front of it. We ran until we reached the middle of the patio and my mom turned back and started screaming for help. So I yelled for help too. Then the crowd stopped and tried to help to hold the guys while police noticed it and came to the rescue. My mom yelled everything that they were doing to us and that the woman was following us. But in the confusion, the woman ran away and the police arrested the two guys. They were known criminals. Meanwhile, a friend of my mom that used to drive combis saw us and offered to take us home. My mom accepted, and we went home without pressing any charges. We both thought it was wrong. We wanted to make sure they got punished for it. But at that time, it seemed the best decision. We just wanted to get out of there. And it took me weeks to get out again. A few weeks later, I got really happy that we didn't go to the police station that day. Our friend and neighbor called my mom to tell her to check Channel 2, local news, and see if it's the same lady. My mom and I sat there, and there was the same woman, arrested for trying to kidnap a kid in a city nearby, with two other giant scary guys. In the end, they mentioned she was a known member of a kidnap chain that sell children's organs in the black market and sometimes sell kids to foreign families to adopt. I tried to find this news video, but it was a local TV news in 1995 or 1996, and I don't even remember the month. It's really hard to find, and there is no way to find it online for obvious reasons. I got happy because these people could never have access to our documents. That would be easy to get if my mom pressed charges, Never underestimate corruption of officers, so they probably would never find me again. So, creepy grin lady, let's not meet. 3. I was about 14 at the time, visiting my relatives in Argentina for a wedding between my cousin and his fiancée. 
My mother and most of my relatives are from Argentina, and we make the occasional visit every so often. During the last few days of our trip is the wedding. The service was in a beautiful chapel, all white marble walls and glass-stained light filtering through. I was bored as hell, though. And being the breed of 14-year-old girl that is not enchanted by weddings or brides or dresses, I was mostly looking forward to the reception, good food, music, anything but the monotonous voice of a priest setting up the wedding vows. The reception was at an old vineyard at a mansion that was rented out for events. The location was lovely, the food was great, the music was pumping, and all was well. There were more people there than I'd ever seen at any sort of celebration. The reception was scheduled to go all through the night until 8am the next morning. At one point, the music coming from the tent outside the mansion was giving me a headache, so I decided to go inside the mansion and just sit, read and write, as I was prone to do at that age. And even now, I was a bit of a wallflower, I suppose. So I went into one of the rooms and leaned against the wall. It was dark, but that was all right. There was sufficient light streaming in through the doors that were on the opposite sides of me, on the adjacent walls. I could hear the bass thumping dully, but my headache started to abate a little as I sat in the partial darkness of the room and began to write. Since there were two open doors that were accessible from the outside, where people were partying, the occasional person would walk through. They'd take note of me, but not much. Some would say, Está bien. And I would reply, Sí, muy bien, gracias. My Spanish wasn't perfect at the time. But I made do. The music intensified and fewer people were coming in as the real dance party started. My head still ached, so I opted to stay where I was, slightly pleased that fewer people were coming in to disrupt the flow of my thoughts. After some time, though, I realized that it wasn't just fewer people coming in, but more so one person. It was a man, perhaps in his twenties or thirties. He had a phone in his hand, and he would walk, at least once a minute, through the room from one door to the other, and then back. It was as though he was pacing. I watched him discreetly. Ed bent down towards my notebook and listened as he spoke on the phone in Spanish, catching it in the snippets where he'd pass through the room back and forth, back and forth. As I said, my Spanish wasn't perfect, but after a few of these rounds, I realized his conversation made very little sense. It was repetitive, kind of nonsensical, fabricated. I became weary. He kept passing back and forth, back and forth, and at one point, he made a half turn towards me when he was halfway through the room, his conversation halting. My head shot up. He resumed walking and talking, back and forth. I had watched enough PSAs and after-school specials to realize that something wasn't right here, so I opted to nobiton out of there and either rejoin the group outside or just find a different room. My headache was returning, perhaps from the stress of focusing on this pacing guy. So I get up when the man walked out of the room on the door that leads to the outside of the house and exit through the opposite door that leads to the main hallway. It's empty, but I can see people outside the windows at the far end of the hall. I walked down the hall, peeking into the open doors flanking me, partially out of curiosity, partially to find a nice place to be. Fun fact, one of the rooms I looked into had a couple having sex against the opposite wall. I quickly continued on, not wanting to be seen catching them in the act. However, this is completely irrelevant to the story. I just found it interesting. I walked through the last door at the end of the hall to my right. I could see my father at the window and I waved to him, and he waved back before turning back to the group he was talking to. The room was well lit and had interesting decor, which I surveyed for a moment before deciding to go outside. I turned around to exit back into the main hallway. The stench of alcohol hit me before I saw him. He was right there. Right there. 
By right there I mean inches away from my face, barely nose to nose. The guy who was pacing in the room earlier was right in front of me, blocking the doorway from the room with spread arms. In the light, I could see he was unshaven and he certainly didn't look like he was dressed for a wedding. I froze from the shock of it. He started speaking to me in Spanish that I couldn't process. All I did was stutter some words in horrible Spanish, something like, No hablo. No entiendo. Que quiere? Or something along those lines. He looked like he was processing for a moment. And then he smiled in a sickening smile. Ah, I see. He said, his grin widening. You speak English. I speak English too, you see. You should trust me. At that moment, as warning sirens rang loudly in my head, I knew to nope it on out of there and fast. One moment I was frozen on the wrong side of the door, and the next thing I knew, I was on the other side of him. Perhaps I ducked under his arm, I don't remember, and bolting out of the house to where my dad was outside. I stuck to his side the rest of the night. I don't know where the creeper went. It wasn't until the end of the night, as I stood between my mom, dad, and brother, as we walked through the hallway to the front entrance, exhausted and ready to get home, that I saw the man again. He was walking through the hallway towards us, looking very pointedly at me. My parents were talking to one another and didn't seem to notice. I tried to avoid his stare by looking at the ground. The hair on the back of my neck was standing on end. But as I passed him, I couldn't help but look up at him. And he grinned that same sickening grin. See you later, American. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here. And thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 236. Thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Okay, I'm sorry about any whiffing you guys can hear in the background, uh, and the neighbor's dogs is expressing themselves. I think they've gone quiet for now. Yeah, okay. Uh, I just, uh, I'd like to say I recently hit 36,000 subscribers. That is amazing to me. I'm kind of hoping, uh, I'm not sure it's going to happen now because uh, daily subscriber numbers are a bit lower than they used to be. But I'm kind of hoping to hit 40,000 by the end of the year. I had to revise my initial hope of 50,000. Uh, so we're, I'm shooting for... Oh, there we go. Yes, yes, we hear you. Okay. Uh, yes, well done. You're, you're very expressive. Maybe they're trying to sing. Okay, anyway. Uh, yeah, I had to revise my initial estimate. So now I'm hoping for 40,000 by the end of the year. Uh, so I'd just like to say welcome to all my new subscribers. Big, big, big thanks to all my previous uh, subscribers who've who've chosen to stick with me uh, over... How long have I been doing this now? Let me think. Right, I went full-time last year, near the end of May, so that'll be a year full-time. And in November, that'll actually make two years total since I first started it. Yeah, so uh, all you guys who've stuck with... I know some of you have been here since day one. And uh, I'm very grateful to each and every one of you, old and new. Uh, you guys have done so much wonderful, so many wonderful things for me. And I appreciate all the help. I, I appreciate those of you who who just leave comments. I appreciate those of you who, who don't even leave comments and just watch the videos. Uh, and I'm also very grateful to those of you who on Facebook and Twitter, they like and they retweet the videos because uh, that helps as well because you guys have actually helped me get get, I'm sure, a few more people here and there by telling your friends and so on. So, and, uh, well, <laughs> I think I'm going on a bit now. And uh, we'll leave it there. Okay, so until next time, thank you very much for listening and take very good care of yourself.